Good morning, church. Good morning. We are very, very glad that you have joined us for our first service of the day here at Living Hope Belfast. Church, if you'd like to stand to your feet, we're going to start with a time of praise and worship together.
you're my author, you're my maker. For you're my author, my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. And you're my helper, my healer, my blessing.
our hearts on the name above all names, on the King of kings and the Lord of lords this morning. Lord, as we come before this table this morning, we are reminded of your son and his sacrifice. We are reminded of the fact that he is our author, our maker, our ransom, saviour, refuge and hiding place. That he has redeemed us this morning. And that we stand here clothed in our right mind because of him this morning, not of anything we have done. Because of your precious son, Jesus. you may take your seats as we come before the table. Good morning. I know it's said every Sunday when someone gets up to bring the ambulance, but isn't it just precious and beautiful? to come in to the presence of God and worship him. Thank you, worship team. What a way to start our service this morning. There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. And the evidence of that power is sitting throughout our congregation this morning. Because at one stage in your life and my life, we bended our knee before Christ. Asked him to come into our hearts, and he is faithful to come in, and has come in, and has radically changed every life in this house this morning. I had some thoughts to give, and, and this morning when I woke up, the thoughts were put out of my head, and I was led, I had been looking at Isaiah 53, a well-known chapter, which we all know. But it was led to the verse, verse 6, our position before God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That was our position before we met Christ, the man of Calvary. We'd all gone astray. We were without hope. We are deep, deep in trouble. And no one was excluded. I read that everyone this morning and saw it, I think as I'd never realized it before. I'm not going to say too much else this morning. But what I am going to do, I want to read you portions from Isaiah 53. So remember, that was our position. And as we just ease and come quiet before God, I want you to focus your attention on God and the Christ man who died for us. Put out all distractions that are around and just focus on Christ. And Isaiah says this in verse 4, Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6 says, And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not just some of it, but all of our iniquity on him. Verse 8 says, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Verse 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin. Verse 11 says, for he shall bear their iniquities. And verse 12 finishes with, because he poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many. And he made intercession for the transgressors. Transgressors means you and I before we come to know God. Jesus paid it all. We owe him everything. 
It struck me this morning as I was reading that chapter. Everyone means you and I. But over and above that, everyone, and every one of those verses I've just read, it's all because of Christ. No one else, nothing else, no payment could be made in money terms. It took Christ to die in your room and in my room, in my place and in your place. And so with those verses in mind, no thoughts of mine, but just simply those verses, I want to come around the table. And if you, ha if you aren't aware, the first layer, we peel it back and it reveals the wafer. And the second layer, when we peel it back, it reveals the juice. But before we do so, I just want to pray. Father, again, we just come around your throne. And Father, as we've been singing, we've been thinking of the time in the future at your decree when we all meet around your throne and we worship your son as we should. Lord, we thank you that he, he gave his body on a rugged tree, on a splintered tree, Lord, and gave himself up for us. Father, we thank you that the penalty was paid at Calvary. We thank you that your son died in our room and in our stead. And that through him, Father, we may find and have eternal life. And Father, we just want to praise your son this morning. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise that you're worthy of. Amen. Paul says this, For I have received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night on which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul then goes on to say in verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Father, again, we just approach your throne. And Father, we, we have this image of your son on the cross. Father, with the blood pouring down through every area of his body. Lord, we, we can't imagine the anguish and the pain that you suffered on the cross. Lord, we can't imagine the anguish as you saw your son die there. But Father, from the bottom of our hearts, we are thankful, so thankful that he willingly took up the cup. Lord, he willingly prayed that your will would be done. Lord, that each of us, through him, finds reconciliation to you. Father, the gap of sin has been bridged. We thank you for your son who died that terrible death on the cross. Lord, thank you for the precious blood. Lord, as we sang at the start, there's power in the blood. And we thank you for the blood, the sin-washing blood. Lord, we just give you the honor and glory. Amen. I'm just going to pray before pastor comes. Father, again, we just 
thank you for this opportunity of coming to your house. Lord, we thank you for, for your word, for your living word, which is a power unto salvation. And Father, we pray for our pastor as he comes. That he will feed us some words from yourself. Lord, bless him. Keep your hand upon him. Lord, lead him where you want him to go. Lord, be unto us everything that we need in our day-to-day -day challenges. We offer you thanks for all your goodness, for all your blessings. Amen. Thank you, Michael, for leading us at the table. The worship team for leading us in worship. Thank you for being here this morning. We well, know it's a challenge for some people because the marathon is running uh, this morning. Um, it's a shame it's been run on a Sunday for it stopped me running it this year. Uh, hopefully they'll change it back to Monday next year so I can run in it. Um, so thank you for being here today. Kids Space is on at the back there. If you head to the back, and Cheryl uh, is taking Kids Space today. Just a couple of announcements just briefly. Tomorrow night, the academy starts uh, in here, in the church, at 7 o'clock with Jackie Roberts. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, but you would like to come, listen, just turn up tomorrow night, and they can get all the details then. So 7 o'clock at the church. It lasts for one hour. Uh, the theme is God, the Holy Spirit. It runs just for four weeks. It's just four weeks, and then, then it's off again. So uh, you don't have to commit yourself to months for this, but it's just, uh, it's just four weeks. So 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Then on Tuesday night, uh, we are meeting uh, as a church to pray together at 8 o'clock. There are many things to pray for. Um, and so we're going to meet together at 8 o'clock on Tuesday night for our encounter prayer meeting and uh, Stephen Fancy is going to be bringing the word on Tuesday evening. We're continuing on today with our sermon series uh, through 1 Timothy and uh, we come today to what is one of the most challenging passages not just in 1 Timothy but in the New Testament itself as it speaks um, of teaching and attitudes that we could possibly seem out of place in the modern world that we live in. Uh, we must not avoid these passages. It's easy to preach uh, easy passages. It's easy just to come with an encouraging message, but we believe that 1 Timothy is the, the word that God has for us in this season as it speaks about the, uh, as I mentioned last week, the three O's the orthodoxy of the church, what it believes, the order of the church, the way God expects us to do things, and then the organization of the church, of how we do things. Uh, and so as we come to this uh, passage today, there is always a balance to be found between what we call, defined as biblical revelation, which is changeless. Uh, that whenever the Bible is written, it's not just for a particular time, it is for eternity. It is as relevant uh, today as it was when it was written. But as with all scripture, it does meet a cultural expression. And that simply means applying it to the world that we live in today and how do we apply it. And so we're going to take a look at this passage uh, today, uh, and I'm hoping, because the job of the person that stands up here, uh, as Timothy has already expressed in the earlier part of 1 Timothy, is to bring clarity to the Bible passages that we look at and not confusion. Uh, we must understand this from the outset, that culture should not and cannot dictate how we do church because we'll be changing it every five minutes, because culture changes every five minutes. And so as we come to what the words that we're going to look at today, we're going to really see, well, what, what does this mean for us today? Because Paul is writing to Timothy, and we know he's encouraging him and challenging him to get the church in order, to deal with the chaos. Uh, to the chapter one was dealing with the ministry of the word. Uh, the start of chapter two that we looked at last week was dealing with the ministry of prayer. 
Uh, this part of chapter 2 that we're looking at uh, deals with the part that, that the people play in it, that the men play in it, and that the women play in it. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to look at chapter 3, and uh, the beginning of chapter 3 is all to do with the elders. It's all to do with the leadership of the church. And then it really sums up this part of 1 Timothy, when it, it really probably encompasses everything that we're talking about, that Paul is writing to Timothy, and what speaks to us is simply about the conduct, our behavior, uh, the way we get on within the household of faith, the church that he talks about. And so that's what we're going to be looking at over these next couple of weeks. So it says this in 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15. It says, therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles of gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. There is not a more simple passage to preach on. That should be very clear to everybody this morning what's been said, but it's not. We're going to take and dig this apart because, as I've said, it says Paul leaves some instructions here, and this is what it's about. He's leaving some instructions for the way the church is to be done. Now, our, the way church is done must come out of the order that comes out of the orthodoxy of the church, which is timeless, which is what is that that it just lasts forever in a sense, because we can't keep changing it. So the first instruction that Paul leaves for Timothy uh, this morning is this, is the first one is this, is, is how a man prays. As you know, remember from last week, if you were here, the first seven verses of 1 Timothy were about the prayer, how we are to pray, and who we are to pray for. Uh, we talked about the kings and those in authority and those in government. And then we talked about, well, who did Jesus come for? And in those opening verses, the word all was mentioned on three occasions. And that gave us an idea of who we are to preach to, who we are to pray for, and who Jesus Jesus came and paid the ransom for and we broke that down last week and so he gives some instructions in the opening of this passage uh, about well how a man prays in the prayer meeting or in his private time the first thing is this is he wants all men to pray everywhere uh, and that's simply that's the challenge for them to pray everywhere then he turns and he says he wants hands that are lifted to be holy and gives two obstacles to prayer anger and disputing and now those are probably quite specific I think for the way that men would probably get on often that actually a good heated discussion or a debate or a dispute about something and if that dispute is not resolved instead of them lifting their hands uh, in prayer holy hands in prayer they will lift their hands like this to sort it out that's a way men might sort out their differences and so Paul is challenging the men here and saying, listen, he says, put all of that aside. He says, if you're going to pray, pray with your holy hands lifted in the air. Psalm 24, verse 2 and 3 simply says, who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. If you remember at the beginning, we, we, we shared with you uh, the overview of 1 Timothy. Uh, that Paul was actually speaking to Timothy and he was creating, he was addressing, sorry, the different groups of people that were in church. And churches are made up of this group of people still today, the men, the women, uh, the younger people, the elderly people, where the leaders fit into this. And so Paul is leaving Timothy the instruction of this. This is how a man prays. I've told you what they need to pray for. I've told you how they need to pray. Well, this is what they need uh, to do. So that would be fairly clear in a sense here of what it does. But then he moves on and he gives another instruction. And the second instruction he gives is this is how a woman dresses. 
Now, before you all say to myself, well, he's going to get at all the women now. I'm not getting at the women at all. And he says, listen, next week, the men will be addressed. This week, the men and the women are going to be addressed. But it's important we look at these passages because it helps us understand this is the way God has designed church to be. Now, it comes really how a woman dresses, that the custom of the day was to display your social status by what you wore and how your hair was done. The argument was, was that what a woman wears was a mirror of her mind, and her beauty is expressed not in outward appearance, but her inward character. Now, there was a problem here in the church in Ephesus, and you have to remember that when you read Scripture, there are two ways that you can read Scripture. The first one is this. The first one, you have to read it in its cultural context, which is the time that it was written in and who it was written to. Now, cultural context is totally different from what we hear today when people say, we have to be culturally relevant. No, no, we don't have to be culturally relevant. We're going to throw that one to the side just for the moment. But we do have to read scripture in its cultural context, which means that in the church here that Paul is writing to, to Timothy in Ephesus, he says what was happening in the status of the day that the women were coming to church, they were a distraction by the way they held their hair, the dresses that they wore, and it was making people feel uncomfortable and giving them a distraction to all the men in the place and also was not a picture of the way the church should be. And so it's a distraction in the worship service. If attention is drawn to a woman's body or beauty when the focus should be on the ministry of the word and prayer. Now, what we're not saying here is we expect all the women here to head down to Primark and go to the sale there and say, I've got to make myself look ugly because that's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. It does not say that anywhere. It said, listen, it said, this is not what this is about. It's always about what the focus is on and does it cause a distraction? And that's the challenge that Paul was laying out to Timothy here in the running and the order of the church. Because what he wanted to focus on more importantly was the modesty. And modesty for both women and men because we live in a world today, whether we like it or not, where the image is as important for a man as it is for a woman. In those days, men had a choice. They simply wore one of those overshawls. That was it. They didn't have any choice. Men, men didn't come with pearls in their hair and plait their hair and do all of that. But the challenge and the difficulty is probably the same today, in a sense, is what is a distraction? What is the focus on? You see, we have made the issue modesty, and the issue really is propriety. Simply, is it appropriate for the occasion? So when somebody comes to church, he says, what they are wearing, is it appropriate for the occasion? I honestly don't believe for a second that God cares whether a woman's hair is plaited or long, or short, or, or anywhere. I don't, I don't believe, honestly, that God cares about that. I do believe he cares if whatever a woman or a man dresses like is a distraction for other believers. And that's what I think Paul is getting at in the passage here, because he's saying, is it appropriate for the occasion? Is it something that matters for the public worship in church? You see, when you wear something... You always look at it and say, is it appropriate for the occasion? Let me give you an example. A bikini, now I'm speaking to the women here, a bikini is appropriate if you go to the beach. It's not appropriate to come to church in a bikini. I just want to clear that up. It says, likewise, it would not be appropriate if it was 30 degrees outside and the beach at Helens Bay was there and everybody was dressed to sit in the sun and I turned up in my suit. It's not appropriate. It's always the appropriate, the propriety of the occasion. I was going to use the example of pyjamas, but then I realised I'm on the shankle and everybody wears pyjamas wherever. <laughs> Is it appropriate for the occasion? Does it cause a distraction? You see, the thing that Paul is getting at here, firstly, is this is not necessarily what a woman wears. It just needs to be modest. 
but it needs to be modest for a man as well. He says, so if you're standing there at the front or if you're doing anything that is ministry, we're saying, well, it needs to be modest. I think people care, well, you know, should your hair be short, should your hair be long? It just needs to be modest and appropriate for the occasion. That's what Paul is saying because the instructions that he's given here is this. Is firstly, he says, uh, for the men to behave properly, don't argue, fight and dispute. The focus is not on how you behave, but how you pray. That's the focus, the instruction. It's easy to look at these passages and say, Paul is only talking to the women. Absolutely not. He's not. He's addressing the men and the women because the men and the women make up the church. And so the second thing he does is this, is he gives the instruction. Listen, the, the instructions for the women are not what you wear, but who you are expressed in what you do. So the good works, the good character, likewise the same for the men as it is for the women, where character and good works matter. Paul is addressing this issue and saying, let nothing distract you from the worship of God. Let nothing take your focus away from why the church is here, from what matters, uh, for what matters when we come to worship God. So he gives that as his second instruction. The third thing he does is this, he gives an instruction which is, who is to do what in the church? And 11 and 12 says this, it says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man she must be quiet. As we read those verses, let us lay down this foundation for the whole of Scripture, for the way God sees us. The first thing is this. Men and women have the same divine image. They're equal before God. It's as simple as that. They have the same divine image. The second thing is this. They have the same status as God's children. Backed up by Galatians 3 verse 28 when the same author, Paul, writes, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That really clears that up as far as value goes. That clears that up as far as the same divine image goes and the same status as God's children. It does not mean in any way that they are inferior. That does not mean in any way that they are inferior. It does not mean in any way that they are less spiritual. This is the key. They are different in role, but never in value. We are created to be different. Men are men, and women are women. They are equal in value, but different in roles. And this is a real challenge for the world that we live in because of the issue of gender identity. Because you can tell you, you can be a man, but if you don't want to be a man, you can identify yourself as a woman. You can be a woman and say, well, I don't want to identify myself as a woman, so therefore I identify myself as a man. So the gender identity is a real huge issue that there is in the world today. And you see, the Bible often brings clarity to this situation that often people don't want to hear because it doesn't fit in with the culture that we live in. But we don't want to fit in with the culture that we live in because we will see as we move on in the verses here, the Apostle Paul does not argue this from culture, but he offers it from the Bible. You see, we live in that world where people, where everybody simply wants to be equal. You can identify almost as non-binary. Well, if you don't want to be a man and you don't want to be a woman, you can just say, well, I'm non-binary. And we are raising a generation of confused children and young people. Because if you listen to some of the nonsense that's around today, it does not bring clarity, which the Word of God is supposed to bring. It just brings confusion to everybody. It is just so murky and so grey. It's no wonder our kids and our young people, that generation, is growing up so confused. Because you're not clear about anything, yet Paul is here. Now, the problem with these verses is this is the feminists have a field day with these verses because they simply are all about equality. You see, a woman can be anything a man can be. And equality is being the same in role, value, and image, which we've already said that actually we're the same in value and image, but we're different in role. That becomes the agenda of today. 
Actually, if men want to wear a dress, well, that's okay. Let's not stop them wearing a dress and simply say to them, well, if that's the way you want to identify, that's the way. And again, it just brings that confusion, doesn't it? He says, because we've lost this thought that runs through Scripture, that, listen, men are men, and women are women. We have exactly the same value before God, but we are different in role. You see, I can stand here today and tell you this. I can tell you everything I understand about women in about three seconds. And it might not take you three seconds. But I could tell you everything I respect I love about women, it will take me ages. Why? Because they're different than men. Men are different from women. Here are four examples. There is some humor in this, but we are different because of this. First one is his colors. Men see red, blue, black, white, yellow, green. Women see 37 different shades of lilac. <laughs> Men need a black TV and a white fridge. Women understand colours and shades. If you don't believe me, look at a lipstick counter or a paint chart. Second difference is this, telephone. Men make a call, it takes them 13 seconds. Hello, what are we doing? Goodbye, bye, 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 bye. Women take one hour and 54 minutes after you make the call. It was a woman who suggested that mobile phones have unlimited minutes. <laughs> Shopping. Men know what they want, where to get it from. A real man never pays for more than one hour of parking. Women, they go in the first shop, they see what they want, they check out 20 other shops, go back to the first shop and buy what they saw in the first place. Is that true or not? Can I hear an amen from the fellas? <laughs> the fourth thing is this, television. Us men, we're simple creatures. We want superheroes and football. Women will watch programs about other women having babies and sit and cry through the whole program. <laughs> then tell you, you should have watched it with them, you would have enjoyed it. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. We are different. And we should love, celebrate, and honour our differences. It is not competition which it has been turned into today. It's complementing. That when God created man and woman, it was never competition. It's never about competition. It's never about a man doing what a woman can do and a woman doing what a man can do. It's simply this. We are equal in status but different in function. And so knowing this and having this as our foundation, it comes to the next instruction that Paul gives Timothy all the way through these verses, which is this, which is deal with the chaos. You see, these verses exist to correct the order of the church because where there is chaos, order has to reign. Paul is bringing clarity to a situation because Ephesus has simply been described as a bastion of feminine supremacy dominated by the worship of the goddess Diana. The Gnostic teaching that we talked about last week, which is those who get saved simply by knowledge alone, extended to this babbling nonsense of women who sat in the meeting and shouted over the man that was teaching at the front. And, and that's what was going on. That's what was happening in the situation. You see, Paul has instructed the men how to pray. But then he says something that's liberating for the women in the cultural context of the day because women were not educated and women were treated as property. They were treated as something that you owned. So Paul liberates them, but he instructs the women, this is how you are to learn. And he wants the women to learn. He wants the women to learn the lessons of the faith. You see, to learn in silence meant that in the meetings, the women could not just shout out. There had to be order. You see, to be silent and quiet was a first century cultural expression. As a matter of fact, if you think about this, we couldn't do this today. The opposite of learning in silence 
is everybody just shouting out. He imagined this morning with me preaching if you just suddenly decided, male or female, that you were just going to shout out any point that you wanted. That's rubbish. No, what about this? Oh, come on, let's do this. And could you imagine? Who would learn anything? Nobody would learn anything. And so that's where we come to the challenge of this passage, because it is challenging, because quietness has more to do with self-control than a lack of sound. Peaceable and quiet life does not describe a life where nobody talks. It is a life without turmoil, controversy, and conflict. When somebody comes to teach, he is teaching people who want to learn. That's the way. Not everybody is a teacher. So we don't have everybody up here and nobody learning. Most people are learners. As a matter of fact, most teachers are learners because you cannot teach what you haven't learned. And so when we look at that passage and we see that, actually Paul is being quite liberating. He says, well, I want the women to learn. And he says, well, what do you mean learn? We well, want them to learn. This is the way that they are to learn. You see, in this situation, what is more important is that a woman is learning, being instructed in the faith, and not teaching what she does not understand. Because you cannot teach what you do not understand. Early on, in my, when I was younger, and you wanted to dazzle everybody with the theology you learned, you would try and preach a sermon that you did not understand yourself. And everybody picked up on that, because if the preacher and the teacher is confused, the people listening are going to be even more confused, because they're like, what's he talking about? He says, there has to be clarity, and there has to be something that's clear. And I shared with you at the beginning that actually we look at the cultural context and the cultural relevance. The cultural context is simply the circumstances and facts around the words that are written in. We cannot avoid the cultural context, which is a particular setting that God spoke his word into. The Old Testament, the ancient Near East, the Gospels, Palestinian Judaism, the New Testament, the Greco-Roman world, there is a cultural context because Jesus entered history, assumed a culture, and spoke a language. But the cultural relevance is the time that it was written in allows us to change it for the world that we live in today. But it's not possible to do that because culture changes all the time. We could literally turn around and say, to be culturally relevant today, we'll ignore next week's passage about the elders, which clearly states that the elders of the church have to be men because they're the husband of one wife, not the wife of one husband. It doesn't say that anywhere. And then it talks in seven verses that he, 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 and I'm taking that to mean men, 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 men. And it says that, so, so it's clear there. So we don't apply the cultural relevance because we can't apply that, because we can't move it to teach or assume authority is simply Paul writing in the context of the local church where public worship is concerned. That that prohibition of verse 12 simply refers to the apostolic teacher in the church. The apostles or the teachers, which had to be men, were the only ones who could teach in the church because they were the teachers. Those, the others, the women were there liberated to learn. You see, there were two extremes when people read this. The first one is this, is literalism. If you are consistent in the interpretation of this passage, you have to do this. The first one is this, men can only pray by lifting their hands. So on Tuesday night when we pray, if you are a man and you stand and you do not lift your hands, you're not being true to the text. You're not being true, consistent with your literal interpretation. The second thing is this, is women should never wear elaborate hairstyles or expensive clothes. Well, that's a lot of nonsense, to be honest with you. Women can wear their hair any way they want. I don't think God cares. I don't think it matters. We have made big deals about things that simply are not big deals. There are people that have had experiences of going to church where you've been told that if you're a woman, please don't wear trousers in the church and say, this is not the church that we do that. And like so much we do, we get the Bible and we say, it doesn't really say that anywhere in there. I mean, this frustrated the life out of me for years in this church because on Mother's Day, 
we would allow the women to lead the communion table and serve the communion and because it was Mother's Day. So I thought, okay, chapter and verse. <laughs> it's not in there. What are we doing? He says, how can we do that? Because it's mothers, we love mothers, we want to celebrate mothers. But suddenly we're not being as literal as we should be. And so therefore we wonder and say, the third thing that we see is this, is there is no circumstance that a woman can ever teach a man. If you're being literal, that's what we have to do. Those three things apply just from this passage alone. Just from this passage, we take the literal interpretation of what that passage says and does those three things. So therefore, in kids' space this morning, if there was a woman that is teaching a young child who happens to be male, get out there. We don't want to teach him in there because he's teaching the men because we've been literal and sticking to the interpretation of the word. It says, see, Paul's the liberals go the other way, you see. Their liberals ignore the cultural context and so dismiss the cold hard truth in favour of a warm, fuzzy interpretation that is based on feelings, tastes and opinions. They argue this. Paul's words belong to an ancient culture. It's completely out of date and irrelevant. They dismiss the orthodoxy and the order and just focus on the organisation because they're looking at it and saying, you know what, that's not for today. We don't live in first century Palestine. We don't live in the Greco-Roman world. We're 21st century Belfast. So it's not really relevant today. People would maybe label it postmodern Christianity, which means take the bits out of the Bible we don't like, that aren't really relevant for today, and then change those. So we're stuck somewhere. And clarity, whenever you're teaching something, always has to bring people into the middle so there is some balance. Because either of these ways is not helpful. The first reason is this. The text has been used improperly and oppressively to deny women's legitimate ministries. The second thing is this. It has imposed on women things which scripture does not impose. If you go literal... Please be prepared to do that with everything you read in Scripture. And I'm going to show you some of the Scriptures in a second. But if you go liberal, then the culture you live in will be reflected in the church. And liberalism suggests it, well, it was only for the church in Ephesus. It reduces the New Testament to a set of letters addressed to specific situations in specific churches to specific individuals that causes rejection of anything taught has only been for that time and place. Those are two extremes. So we've got to try and bring them over into the middle. You see, these verses that Paul writes, they do not forbid women to educate, speak, pray, proclaim truth or prophesy. In Acts 18, 26, so he, Apollos, who is mentioned in 1 Corinthians, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Aquila and Priscilla are women. They take Apollos, who is one of the teachers of the New Testament church, because he had heard about the baptism of John, but not about the baptism of Jesus. So Priscilla and Aquila bring him to the side. Now, it doesn't tell us where they brought him to the side. I know they took him aside, could mean anywhere. But they, they taught him. They, they told him the, the way of God more accurately. Why? So he could spread the word more effectively. It says the second verse that we see, it says 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. When Paul says, and now remember, this is in the context of church worship. This is in the same passage that has been read from this morning concerning the communion table. It's in the context of church worship. So it says, but every woman who prays or prophesies. So that tells us that women in the church in Corinth were praying and prophesying. So we know that they are speaking out in the church service. The third one we see is this, is in Acts 2 verse 17, it says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Now, if this was just such a literal, if this was such a foundational issue that was absolutely grounded in truth, it simply could say, and we would lose nothing from it, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters. But it doesn't say that. It gives them the function, the purpose of the Spirit being poured out, which is upon your sons and daughters who will prophesy. 
And the final one is this, is Philippians 4 verse 3 says, Help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. So Paul has got women at his side contending in the cause of the gospel. Now I know as one person said to me at some point, and I thought, well, I'm not going to take any notice of that. Maybe they were just there to prepare the food and, and, and make the tea, you know, the sort of thing we reduce it to when it comes to women. But I don't believe that. I believe Paul actually says that with there, we had his side to contend at the cause of the gospel, to preach the gospel, to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, where does this bring us to in our church? Where do we come to? Because at Living Hope, this is where we are, and we have to look at this and say, well, what do we practice here? I'll give you three quick things. I believe this. The women can minister, but they cannot be the minister. Women can be a leader, but not the leader. Women can be a teacher, but not the teacher. I believe, as we will look at in a second with the time that we've got left, that Paul moves on to speak about headship being male. But in that headship is the leadership of what goes on in the home and what goes on in the church. And so, therefore, we are not limiting women's ministry in any way, shape, or form. But we do take what 1 Timothy 3 says about eldership, which is simply says a husband of one wife, and he, 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 says to us that leadership is male. But you see, what we've got to look at here is this. I don't believe this. I don't believe that in a sense that what Paul is saying, in a sense, is forbidding and stopping women having any sort of ministry because it is not the women, ministry of women that is the issue here. It is the authority of women. And so, therefore, Paul does not argue from culture but from Scripture. We must never reflect culture, we must reflect God's word. We must hold tight to the timeless expressions of New Testament teaching, but hold loosely to their application, which is simply Paul is talking here about submission, he's talking about authority. Now, in the, the world that we live in today, people don't like authority, yet submission to one another and to different groups of people run all the way through the New Testament. Order of God is submission, is a principle that runs through the New Testament where there is an order that God has designed for human society at many levels. That bit has not changed. That's the timeless expression of the revelation of the Word of God, and that has not changed. Not to keep women in their place, because we don't want to do that, because we believe in women being equal in value, and we believe that they have a different role, and therefore there are ministries and functions that they can fill within the church. But what I'm saying clearly is I believe that leadership, the leader, the person at the top, the headship, has to be male because it's a practice of family and is a practice of church. Now you might disagree with me and that's okay. I don't mind that. In 20 years, you'll not be the first person. But what we have to do is break down the passages that we read at and see. See, here we see that there is submission to one another. There is submission to the authorities. There is submission to the church leaders. There is submission to your elders and submission is always voluntary and willing and not lording it over you you will do because i am the man paul is not instructing society here he's not telling every woman you are subject to every man he's not saying that he is saying submit to your leaders within the church which you know something the men have to do as well the men don't get a Bible when it comes to church. I remember, and different people will tell you different things with church. I remember one fella coming into church. He'd been coming to church for a while, and he said to me, we come with the membership forms. He said, would you like to be a member of our church? Would you like to join the family? And he turned to me and he says, I'm not becoming a member of this church because I don't want to submit to you boys. Now, I'm assuming it meant me, Stephen, Jackie, and Jackie, which as far as I'm concerned, you can't beat four nicer fellas, but this fella, <laughs> he didn't want to do that. And I actually turned around to him and said, but listen, if you come in through the doors there and you take a seat in church, 
He said, you're submitting to the leadership of the church. Oh, I'm not, I'm not. I said, listen, you stand up and say something you shouldn't say. I will show you how you're submitting to the leadership of the church. Because we all have to do that. Everybody submits to somebody. Our struggle is sometimes is we've made it a whole gender issue. It's not. Everybody submits. I have to submit. You have to submit. We all submit. And so here we look at it, and, and we haven't time to go into it because of time, but Paul gives a reason, not as cultural, but biblical. It's God's order. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Genesis 2, verse 14, it says, And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Adam was formed first. God created Adam out of the dust of the ground. But what is interesting here, and I never noticed this before, when God gave Adam the instruction of not eating from the tree, he was alone. Eve was not created at that point. They hadn't made Eve yet. It says the responsibility of the leadership of headship right from the beginning in Genesis 2, and it's the pattern we follow, was when God said to Adam, you must not eat from the tree. And it was his job as the leader, simply because God had formed him first, had created him first, to be the one who was to lead everybody who came after. So though Eve was deceived, Adam lost his full responsibility. He, he neglected his responsibility of being the head of the family, being the leader in his role. Eve was created as a companion and as a helper, not as the leader, not as the one to take Adam's place. Adam's responsibility was neglected in God's order of things. That's clear there from what we read in Genesis. We cannot change that. It's why Paul does not give a cultural answer, but he gives a biblical answer. And he says, this is why. This is why I want this to happen. This is why I want you to sort out the chaos, put the house in order, so it functions the way that God says it's supposed to. And so therefore the responsibility of him is simply this, to be the leader. And he uses that example. And at times women step in to lead because us men aren't doing it and we should be doing it. Women step in to do all the praying because us men aren't leading and doing it. He says it's more important for us to take our kids to football than it is to lead our kids to bring them to church. And it says, men, we are failing. So therefore, we must make sure that we take hold of our responsibility that is given us. Because if we turn around and say, we are the leaders, we are the heads of our family, and we are the leaders in the church, and they says, we need to start acting like it and do it. But that's our responsibility, particularly in the day and the age that we are living in. We need to get rid of our Fred Flintstone theology, which simply shouts at a woman, Wilma! <laughs> because we have a tremendous responsibility that simply says, we lead. And I've never met a married woman. I've never met a wife. It's a problem with submission. When a husband is loving her and caring for her and providing for the family, and leading for the family, and doing all the stuff that we are called to in Scripture. My final quote is from Matthew Henry, and I think he knows a bit about the Bible, just get his commentary. He says, be careful if you make a woman cry, because God counts her tears. The woman came out of a man's ribs, not from his feet to be walked on, not from his head to be superior, but from his side to be equal, under the arm to be protected, and next to the heart to be loved. So therefore, our responsibility as men is clearer to do what we need to do, both in the family and the home, but also in church as well. That may have well brought you more questions and answers, and that's okay. But one thing we're not doing is avoiding the passage and trying to share what we believe that it says. And so we're going to come and pray. And if you do have any questions, you can fire them up me either by text message or get in touch with me. And then we can discuss this further. But we are different in role, but the same in value. 
We are all children of God. Christ Jesus came for all, men and women. No superiority and no inferiority. Let us pray. Father, we come before you today. Father, we should take the challenge of your word. Father God, we believe that your spirit will take that word and it speaks to our hearts. And Father God, many people have uh, tried to interpret and read and study what your word says, Father God. And as they do that, Father, we ask, particularly here today, that God, if above nothing else, it just brings some clarity. It clears up some confusion. It makes us stand biblically in 2021 that just simply says what we believe you're trying to say through your word. For we want to be a church, Lord, that worships you. Father, we want to be a church that sees both men and women saved. We want to see a church, Father, where men and women are released into ministry. We want to be a church, Father God, that fulfills your order, that does the things that you have called us to do, the way you've called us to do it. And so, Father, we thank you for the time spent in your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father God, we thank you for this time spent in your presence this morning. Father God, we thank you for your word that has been brought to us today. We thank you for your faithful servant who has delivered that this morning, even though it may be a challenge this morning. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing in each of our lives. We thank you for this church family that you've kept us safe and that you're with us wherever we go in this week. We pray you would bring us all back safely again next week in the name of your precious son, Jesus.